Throughout history, the technology of war has continually changed, but the art of war, how a commander commands, has remained more or less the same. Nations have gone out of existence because of their failure to understand what war is all about, including its diplomatic, economic, and social elements. A great commander, one way or another, always seems to understand how all these forces are interrelated. Along these roads, 50 miles south of Washington, D.C., one of the fiercest encounters of the American Civil War was fought. The Union commander, Ulysses S. Grant, knew that the outcome of this, the Battle of the Wilderness, would decide the future of the United States. At the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861, Grant was working in a hardware store. Within three years, he had become commanding general of the armies of the northern states, and within seven years, had been elected president. Although a modest and simple man, the upheaval of civil war gave him the opportunity to show that he possessed the qualities of a great commander. We're beginning to see Grant as uh, almost the patron saint of American modern military thought. He's probably the first modern total warrior that the Americans have produced, and as such, probably since the 19th century, since that the world produced. He seemed to recognize both the practical aspects and the emotional aspects of total war, which means that you make war on every single facet, at every level of society, culture, political, military, economic, uh, vir virtually the whole spectrum of life. US Military Academy at West Point, New York State. In the middle of the last century, officers were educated here who would soon have to fight each other in a bloody civil war. One of these, born in 1822 in Point Pleasant, Ohio, son of a leather merchant, was Ulysses Simpson Grant. A military life had no claims for me. And I had not the faintest idea of staying in the army, even if I should be graduated, which I did not expect. Not an ideal student, his list of misdemeanors was long. However, he graduated in 1843, intending, after a spell in the small national army, to become a professor of mathematics. But two years later, the United States went to war against Mexico, and Grant was called upon to fight. He fought with distinction, and when the war ended in 1848, he decided to remain in the military. But peacetime soldiering did not suit him. He resented the strict discipline and turned to drink. He resigned, and having failed in farming and real estate, he rejoined his younger brothers in the family business. <laughs> 
I think Grant had a very sensitive temperament. He uh, was an accomplished painter of natural scenes. And I think he was a very sensitive man. You can see that in his dealing with subordinates. Uh, I think he would have been offended at some of the things in the Mexican War. And uh, his own uh, career uh, after the Mexican War was marred by the fact that in his assignments he could not have his family with him. And uh, so I don't think it was disillusionment with the Mexican War as much as the family situation that prompted him to resign his commission. And he always thought of himself as a businessman. He wasn't, but that's the way he viewed himself. The Union of States was, at this time, undergoing great change and, as a result, was beginning to tear apart. The northern states, with a population of 22 million, were industrializing and absorbing increasing numbers of hard-working immigrants. The southern states, with its population of 9 million, over three million of whom were slaves, were staunchly agricultural. When the northerner, Abraham Lincoln, who had expressed anti-slavery views, was elected president in 1860, 11 southern states voted to secede from the Union. They declared themselves a confederacy, outraging the remaining 22 states. In April 1861, the first shots of the Civil War were fired. The American Civil War is a linking struggle between, on the one hand, the dramatic wars of Napoleon at the beginning of the 19th century and the lead up towards the Armageddon of the horrors of the First World War in the early years of the 20th. Now in terms of actual elements which were new in it, it was a war fought by mass conscript armies on both sides and that was a novelty. There had been conscripts before in Europe, the French army of Napoleon for example, but very often he was fighting against regular forces. But here we have two national people's armies, if you like, fighting one another and that had various effects. Secondly, there was of course the impact of railways on warfare for the first time on any scale. Log case of logistics, it was a matter of moving your troops and their supplies far faster and more economically than had been possible in earlier generations when they had to march or haul their stores in wagons. And secondly, the railway telegraph was going to make it possible for politicians in Washington, above all the president himself, Mr. Lincoln, to keep a very close tab on what the generals were doing at the front. Volunteer soldiers rushed to fight but the U.S. Army consisted of only 16,000 officers, widely scattered, protecting settlers on the western borders. The South had no army at all. As a West Point graduate, Grant offered his services, but was rejected, possibly because of his earlier resignation or reputation as a drinker. But he persisted and eventually secured command of an infantry regiment. I saw new energies in him. He dropped a stoop-shouldered way of walking and set his hat forward on his head in jaunty fashion. Grant is, on the surface, a quite simple man. He does not try to be something he is not. He is not a man of great pretensions. He doesn't like the fanciful um, trimmings that often go with the military. He is well known for hating to wear dress uniforms, for instance. And a lot of times when you see him in pictures wearing a, just a private's uniform with his rank just light, just loosely sewn onto the shoulders. You're seeing the real Grant there. The North intended to strangle the rebel states without delay by naval blockade and two main military thrusts. The first in the East against the Confederate capital Richmond, the second in the West to gain control of the Mississippi River and two of its key tributaries, the Tennessee and the Cumberland. Grant, having been promoted, was soon in command of minor engagements on and around these rivers. Certainly there's nothing that really uh, stands out about uh, Grant in, in, the, in the first uh, 
uh, several battles that he participated in that would indicate here was a great commander. But there were some features of his character that, uh, that might suggest this. Uh, the first time he was uh, in a real uh, situation where he might confront the enemy. He wrote that uh, as his men marched around a bend expecting to find Confederates, he said, our hearts were in the throat, every one of us. When we got there, we found that the enemy had discarded his equipment and left. And he said, I learned there a lesson I never forgot, and that is that the enemy is as afraid of me as I am of him. It sounds very simple, but it's a very profound truth. In February of 1862, Grant was in command of the attacks on Fort Donelson on the Cumberland River and Fort Henry on the Tennessee. His perseverance brought him success, the first major Union victories. He wrote to the defeated Confederate commanders demanding unconditional and immediate surrender. And the legend of U.S. Unconditional Surrender Grant was born. He carried on southward and fought his first major battle at Shiloh in April 1862. After the first day at Shiloh, Grant is standing behind his lines, just thinking about what he's been through, no doubt smoking a cigar. You never saw Grant too far from cigars. And General Sherman comes up to him, and together they begin to talk about what they've seen that day. Sherman's a bit more rattled than Grant is. Sherman has seen his lines break. He's had to try to rally his men. He's had a rough day of it, but he notices that Grant, after all of this action, seems very, very calm. Now, Grant's been put in a very busy day. He's gathered a great deal of Union artillery and basically established a safe haven for the Union troops to retreat to. He's been very active, but he doesn't seem to be out of sorts for it. He doesn't seem to be unduly flustered by watching his army collapse around him. And Sherman says, it's been a rough day, hasn't it? Grant just leans back and says, that's all right, we'll just get him tomorrow. And get them he did. By the end of 1862, he had reached the key to the Mississippi, Vicksburg, a city that the Confederate President Jefferson Davis had called the nail that holds the South's two halves together. It was a well-fortified stronghold dominating the river. Attempts to assault the city in the past had been unsuccessful. But Grant refused to be beaten he decided to steam a little way down the river and disembark onto the western bank. Then he and his men began to hack their way through forest and swamp. His superiors were convinced that by abandoning his lines of supply, he would certainly fail. Grant pressed on, convinced that too many generals did not understand the nature of this war. Some of our generals failed because they worked out everything by rule. They were always thinking about what Napoleon would do. Unfortunately for their plans, the rebels would be thinking about something else. With the support of Union ships, which had succeeded in steaming past Vicksburg, Grant transported his soldiers back across the river, worked his way up to the city of Jackson, and then attacked Vicksburg from the east. After a short siege, the stronghold fell. The Union now had control of the Mississippi. President Lincoln had been watching Grant and was impressed with his victories. Since the beginning of the war, Lincoln had appointed and dismissed three commanding generals. Numerous attempts on the Confederate capital Richmond had failed. At last, Grant seemed the kind of commander that he needed. Well, you know how it's been with all the rest. As soon as I put a man in command of the army, he'd come to me with a plan of campaign and about as much say, now, I don't believe I can do it, but if you say so, I'll try on, and so put the responsibility of success or failure on me. It isn't so with Grant. I'm glad to find a man who can go ahead without me. In March of that year, Grant was summoned to the White House in Washington and made the new Union commanding general. 
Lincoln used to say to critics of Grant, who was accused by many of his contemporaries of being a drunkard, which he had been, of being a failed tanner and a failed farmer, which he had been too for several years, was interposed in the middle of his military career. He would always answer these kinds of criticisms with the phrase, I need this man, he fights. The Battle of the Wilderness marks a watershed in the history of warfare. The men who fought so furiously through the undergrowth and trenches in this tangled forest were among the first to experience the devastating reality of modern warfare. Exploiting the North's superiority in men and materials Grant's strategy was to attack on many fronts and keep up the pressure, no matter what, until the South had been so stretched and weakened that it would be forced to surrender. The two main Union thrusts would be in the direction of the capital, Richmond in the east and Atlanta in the west. It wasn't the cities that Grant wanted, but the Confederate armies that would be forced to come out and defend them. What Grant does, among other things, is teach armies how to put together a coordinated strategy. The Civil War, when we first started out, was a series of unrelated campaigns. When Grant became commander, every Union soldier who wore a blue uniform was technically under his command, and he could order multiple armies to do multiple things just by sending off a wire on the telegram. He was one of the first to really conceive of strategy in a, in a national sense, grand strategy. Uh, a strategy that was not just one army against another army for a, a theater goal or an, an immediate goal, but how to make many armies do many things to accomplish one big final victory. I look upon the conquering of the organized armies of the enemy as being vastly more important than the mere acquisition of their territory. It's okay to capture southern geography but only if it's going to lead to the result that everybody wants, the end of the war, the crushing of the rebellion. What Grant will do is to change the goals, change the focal point of his actions. Instead of the Union armies going after a city, such as Richmond, or going after another piece of geography, such as a mountain range or an important river, it is now important to go out and find the Confederate armies. It's the Confederate armies that is allowing the Confederacy to continue to exist. Defeat the armies, you defeat the rebellion. And that's an important switch. The Confederates were already having trouble recruiting and supplying their armies. Grant made matters deliberately worse by putting an end to prisoner exchanges, by seizing or burning crops, and by destroying factories. I think he applied common sense to war, and that is one definition of strategy. Common sense applied to the art of war. He did that. Uh, I think he was able to uh, bring to bear all of the superior resources of the North against the South. That had not been done before. Uh, I think he uh, understood the re relationship between the military and the political and never tried to intrude. Uh, I think he had faith in himself, in his plan, and in, in his men. And uh, I, th I think uh, that paid off. Uh, he's, not, he, he's not a Napoleon with bold proclamations and dazzling campaigns, but he looked at war very much the same way that Napoleon did. One phrase they both use in their correspondence is to maneuver according to circumstances. They both made plans. They realized they were going to have to adjust, perhaps abandon one plan to do something else. Uh, they accepted that, felt quite comfortable in that environment. So I think Grant orchestrated uh, the, uh, all of the forces of the, of, of the democracy. Uh, it was the North in 1864. Uh, and uh, as long as Lincoln would continue to support him and those casualties, victory was just a matter of time. Grant was not the sort of man to stay in Washington when the fighting began, 
he would be with the army that made the assault towards Richmond and against the South's leading general, Robert E. Lee. Lee had been one of West Point's finest cadets, and when the Civil War began, both sides asked him to be their commanding general. He chose the South and had become the Union's most difficult opponent. Robert E. Lee is still the most romantic figure coming out of the Civil War, uh, both North and South. He's undoubtedly the most popular military commander out of that war. He's been viewed as a, you know, a, a saint. The Lost Cause group after the Civil War showed him to be almost a messiah. And he was a, he was a great general, there's no doubt about that. He did, with limited assets, an amazing amount of damage to the Union cause. But my feeling is that he was probably best he could probably be best remembered as the last of the great old-style warriors. And Grant is the first of the great new-style warriors. Grant based himself with the section of the Union Army commanded by General Meade that was stationed between Washington and Richmond and which Grant had detailed to head south to confront Lee. The army of 120,000 men was to cross the Rapidan River and by heading for Richmond draw Lee and his 60,000 troops into battle. Grant, having crossed the river, had no choice but to march through an area of dense forest known as the Wilderness. He hoped to clear the area before Lee arrived. But Grant was willing, if necessary, to fight him, even here. Grant intended to keep fighting until the war was won. Preparations were the key to maintaining what could be a long campaign. The region is heavily timbered, and the roads are narrow and very bad after the least rain. To provision an army campaigning against so formidable a foe through such a country from wagons alone seemed almost impossible. System and discipline were both essential to its accomplishment. He was a master of logistics and used the river system very effectively during the 64 campaign to provide his armies. I think he changed his base of supplies three times during a campaign. He had 125,000 rations afloat that he could land anywhere he needed them. You could not have run Grant's campaign in 64 without the steam engine. He is absolutely efficient in the logistical preparations he makes for this campaign. He is not going to move off, despite the pressures he is receiving from Washington, until he was ready, got the right supplies ready, the right forms of uh, wagon trains and what have you to support his army. Therefore, it is sheer careful preparation of this campaign, which I also think marks him as a great commander at this stage. By May 1864, he was ready. Grant hated the war. Indeed, he hated the sight of blood but he was sure that only by fighting on until the rebel states realized they could not win would the conflict be brought to an end. This he was determined to do. On the 4th of May, Lee looked down from a hillside camp and saw Grant heading towards the Rapidan River. Lee was outnumbered, but he intended to use the terrain to his advantage. Neither Grant's numerical superiority nor his artillery would be decisive if Lee attacked him in the woods. Lee knew the area. This was Confederate land. Some of his soldiers had been brought up here. The odds were evened out. Grant crossed the Rapidan unopposed, unsure of Lee's intentions. It was impossible to get through the wilderness in one day because of his long, slow train of supply wagons. He was forced to stop overnight. The next morning dawned, hot and humid. 
Grant ordered the advance to continue. Meanwhile, Lee's armies were closing in. If attacked, Grant had no plans for elaborate tactical deployments. He would rely on brute force. Grant is, a, is, in my estimation, the first modern military commander that the Americans have to look to. And in the words of Russell Weigley, a, a very acclaimed military historian, he is a, Grant is, in fact, the basis of American military doctrine. It's not very subtle. It's kind of in-your-face military operations. Uh, find them, fix them, destroy them, and get it over with. The fighting focused on the two main east-west roads, the Orange Turnpike and the Orange Plank Road. On the turnpike, Union soldiers saw Confederates in the distance and deployed to attack. Meanwhile, Union cavalry along the southern plank road had been confronted by a large force of Confederate infantry. Grant's men beat a hasty retreat. It was a wrestle as blind as at midnight, a gloom that made maneuvers impracticable, a jungle where regiments stumbled on each other and on the enemy in turns, firing sometimes into their own ranks and guided often only by the crackling of the bushes or cheers and cries that rose from the depths around. Throughout the war, frontal assaults had usually failed. The introduction of rifles and the rapid disappearance of smoothbore muskets had given the defender the upper hand. Along both roads, inconclusive skirmishing continued. By dusk, the opposing sides had dug in, scouring the landscape with trenches. That night, southern soldiers discussed the threat they faced. That man will fight us every day and every hour until the end of the war. Grant is interesting to watch during the Wilderness Campaign, mostly for what he doesn't do. He doesn't ride through the front lines. He doesn't live up to the old traditional way of leading troops by waving his saber and yelling forward. And he, he's, not, he's obviously not out to show personal courage and, and try to, to enhance any kind of personal reputation here. He is the more modern soldier in that he directs from the rear. He allows his field commanders to fight the battle in the field. He stands back, he takes in all the information that's coming from different parts of the battlefield, and he redeploys where necessary, he pulls back where necessary, he orders advances where the opportunity it offers itself. He, he is a very modern commander in that regard. He is directing from the rear. They used to say, when that war began, that an, ar that an army commander leads from the front. Grant rewrites that script a bit. I think the uh, most fascinating thing about Grant is his mind. Uh, he is portrayed uh, very often as uh, sort of stolid, unimaginative, uh, a man who liked to drink, and a man who won by uh, overwhelming numbers. And the more I read of Grant's own correspondence, and the more I uh, 
studies campaigns, uh, the more ridiculous I think this is. Uh, he was a, uh, for his time, I think a, a very uh, sophisticated general. But uh, his genius lay in simplicity, not complex maneuvers. I think he had all of the, uh, the temperament uh, that a, a commander, successful commander needs. And he had uh, great moral as well as physical courage. As the general felt that he could be found more readily and could issue his orders more promptly from the central point which he had chosen for his headquarters, he remained there almost the entire day. He would at times walk slowly up and down, but most of the day he sat upon the stump of a tree or on the ground, and his penknife was kept in active use whittling sticks. Grant spent the evening of the 5th issuing overall directives while leaving General Meade in direct control of most of the troops. There is one striking feature of Grant's orders. No matter how hurriedly he may write them on the field, no one ever has the slightest doubt as to their meaning, or even has to read them over a second time to understand them. He was a man like Wellington, with an extraordinary eye for ground. Uh, an extraordinary memory for maps. His staff always commented on that. Um, an extraordinary memory for detail. And yet at the same time, he was able to dismiss uh, irrelevant detail and to concentrate his mind on the very essence of the task, the problem, the situation. Uh, and uh, as a result, issue a very clear direction to his subordinates as to what was required of them. He had a genius for war, there is no question of, of that. His order for the next day's fighting was typically to the point. If any opportunity presents itself for pitching into a part of Lee's army, do so. Grant ordered an early morning attack on either side of the plank road to the south. Despite the difficulties of terrain, it began well and forced the Confederate troops back as far as Lee's own camp. But artillery and the fortuitous arrival of reinforcements stopped and reversed the attack. The Confederates then launched their own assault, but it was cut short when their general was accidentally shot by his own troops. At 3 p.m., Grant ordered an offensive, but the ground was simply too difficult to cross with any speed or cohesion. Lee made his response soon after, but he could not breach the Union defenses. Near the turnpike to the north, the Confederates discovered that the Union's right wing was weak. A strong attack beat back that end of the line, but night fell before more than a few hundred prisoners could be captured. By the next day, the 7th of May, Grant felt the battle had run its course. Neither side could claim victory, though Grant wrongly believed he had suffered fewer casualties than Lee. In fact, 18,000 Union troops lay dead or wounded compared to 11,000 Confederates. The Union soldiers now waited. The battle had ended in stalemate. Would this advance on the Confederate capital conclude, like previous attempts, in a retreat to Washington? I would say Grant's greatness in the wilderness comes on the, on the 7th, the, la the day after the fighting is over when his army is pulled out and heads south instead of north. Traditionally, after a big battle and after taking heavy losses, the armies separated, would go back into camp, uh, heal their wounds, and then perhaps a few months later, a fight again. I think the important contribution that Grant makes here is that he was not going to allow this breathing spell this time. He was going to, con going to continue to move south toward Richmond, put himself or try to put himself in a position where Lee would have to attack him, continue to fight Lee, continue to 
to drain Lee's strength and keep the fight going. I intend to fight along this line if it takes all summer, he'd say, and the reason was to keep on wearing Lee down. Grant's decision to continue south, despite the high casualties, was a turning point in the conduct of the war. The Union soldiers, often demoralized in past campaigns by the order to retreat, responded with excited enthusiasm. Soldiers, weary and sleepy after their long battle, with stiffened limbs and smarting wounds, now sprang to their feet, forgetful of their pains, and rushed forward to the roadside. Wild cheers echoed through the forest. It's an example, this campaign, of how tactical failure can, on rare occasions, in fact, achieve strategic success. Grant, by tying down Lee, ensured the success of Sherman in his campaign over by Atlanta and thence eastwards, southeastwards, towards the sea. That was going to be one of the great events which brings the Confederacy, virtually speaking, to its knees within the next 12 months. His view of the war, therefore, was much more orientated to the strategy or even the grand strategy of it rather than the immediate fighting of the battles on the particular sector. He could see beyond the immediate fighting. And in that vision, I think, lies one of the attributes of greatness in Grant. Grant allowed no respite. He ordered all Union armies to keep on fighting. Although throughout May, the Army of the Potomac alone suffered 70,000 casualties, Grant knew that Southern resources were at breaking point. Grant uh, was called a butcher. Uh, most of the people who called him a butcher were Southerners. Different uh, people who study the numbers and proportions of casualties have shown very effectively that in all of his battles that he fought, Grant lost maybe a total of about 9% of his army. On the other hand, Robert E. Lee is up above 20% casualties. And when you recognize the difference in the numerical numbers of those casualties, you find out that in real numbers of thousands of soldiers, Grant lost many, many fewer thousands of soldiers than did, than did Robert E. Lee. And uh, just from a practical point of view, Lee couldn't afford to lose that many people. And so who's the butcher? Underneath the surface, I think he's a very complicated man. He has to deal with a great deal of contradictions in his life. He has to fight a war to end slavery, yet his wife owns slaves. He has to fight a, a war a, a, that will force him to fight against many of his own best friends. Some of the best men at his wedding were now wearing Confederate gray and fighting across the lines. One of the most telling things about the kind of challenge that faced Ulysses Grant during the war was during the siege of Petersburg when he hears about one of his friends across the line who has just had a baby son. He lights up he orders some of the soldiers in his area to light up bonfires as a salute. And through the lines, he and a few of his other brother union officers send a, a, ch a children's tea service across the line to the son of Confederate General George Pickett. The battles continued. Lee was so tied down by Grant's persistent offensives that he couldn't send help to Atlanta, which fell to Sherman in September 1864, just in time for the northern state's presidential election. I think one, one could argue that Grant probably, uh, in a very real sense, was the man primarily responsible for winning the Civil War, because uh, there was a strong peace movement growing in the North before Grant took over. Uh, the draft was far from popular. You had draft riots not only in New York City, but in others. Uh, there was a war of weariness. Uh, and uh, 
And he began to find soldiers. Oliver Wendell Holmes, a Supreme Court justice, wrote after Gettysburg, I'm not going to re-enlist, uh, and he was an officer. Uh, we, we can't beat these fellows. Uh, Grant uh, gave them the determination to do that. He infused the army with his, with, with his determination. And uh, uh, if it had not been for, uh, this is my view, if it had not been for Sherman's capture of Atlanta and Sheridan's victories in the Shenandoah Valley just weeks before the election, I think that uh, uh, Lincoln might well not have been reelected. His opponent was General McClellan, now out of the army, running on a peace compromise platform. So I think uh, we were much closer in 1864 to not winning that war than most people now would uh, readily assume. Grant and Lee continued to fight until the ruined Confederate capital fell on April 2nd, 1865. By April 9th, Lee had little option but to surrender, here at the Appomattox Courthouse. Within a month, all the other southern armies had given up the fight. The war was over. The Civil War had resulted in over one million casualties, but Grant had been undeterred by the realities of battle. He had fought ruthlessly to destroy his opposition and to end the war. Grant had seen warfare for what it was, no longer the province of professional armies, but entire nations, no longer reliant on brilliant tactics, but on persistent, determined strategy. Grant's influence on the course of history was simply in the fact that he won this war. If the Union had lost this war, certainly the history of the United States would be very different. In fact, there might be the history of the United States and the Confederate States. The United States was left with the task of reconstruction. The South particularly had been devastated and its economy could no longer rely on slavery. In 1868, Grant, who had won the respect of both sides in the war, was elected president, but his eight-year presidency was undistinguished and marked by scandal involving members of his administration. In the year before his death, he wrote his memoirs, considered to be one of the finest pieces of American literature. With typical determination, he finished it days before he died on July 23rd, 1885. Ulysses S. Grant could easily have remained an unknown and undistinguished small-town businessman, but war provided the opportunity for him to prove himself. The characteristics that may have ill-suited him in peacetime fueled his rise to overall military command and subsequent Union victory. He has established his name in American history as both a president and as a writer, but above all, he is remembered as a great commander.